welcome to this uh, webinar today that we're going to have on the uh, AMD Bravado Design Suite Essentials. So we're going to take a look at how we can uh, develop better RTL in our designs. If somebody could just pop a message in the chat and let me know they can hear me all and they can see me all, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to be uh, about a um, perfect. So it's going to be about an hour today as we go through here. I'll stop, answer questions as you want to. Uh, as you want to go through. What we'll do is we'll make sure that all this, the, the videos recorded uh, and we'll put it on our, you'll be able to come back to uh, Livestorm and see it. And you'll also be able to see it on uh, my YouTube channel as well. So we'll make sure that there's a link off the website uh, to the YouTube channel and we will share all these slides. Uh, we'll share all the slides as well as we're going, uh, as we're going through it. So like I say, as we, as we work through this, uh, please uh, just give us a shout um, if you've got any questions, any thoughts, any comments. Uh, just pop them in the chat, and I will try and keep an eye on it and try and answer them uh, as we uh, as we go through. Uh, but there's just me here, so I'll just have to keep an eye on the chat as we go through. So if I miss something, I'll try to come back to it. Uh, try to come back to it at the end. Uh, so it's going to be a good uh, going to be a good session today. I think it's going to be uh, hopefully it's going to be informative, and hopefully it's going to help us write little better uh, RT, RTL code. And of course, as always, there's my uh, email on the slides as well. So if anybody's got any uh, questions or issues, uh, you can just give me a quick message after that and we'll, uh, we'll try and get back, to, um, get back to it all later on uh, and, answer the, and answer the question if we, if we need anything. Uh, so let's take a look at today. What we're gonna do is we are gonna run through uh, we're going to take a brief look at what the ultra-fast design methodology is. In fact, I don't actually have a slide on that. I'm just going to talk about it in a minute. Uh, then we're going to take a look at how we can do some things that are going to help us with our FPGA design. So one of the number one things that I'm, big, I'm a big fan of when it comes to thinking about FPGAs and how we design them is we're going to take a look at how we can architect our design. So that's how we can go from a concept uh, and some requirements that a customer gives us all the way through to a working VHDL or Verilog design implemented, uh, implemented in Vivado. We're going to look at some tips and techniques that we can do uh, along the way to do that. Hopefully, what, what I'm going to talk about when we talk about architecture, and I'd love for you to feedback uh, what, your, what your thoughts and how you go about and approach doing your architecture is. Uh, but I, we're going to talk about some things that will help us not only with reuse and design and, and, design and such like, but also help us to create an architecture that allows us to get a better implementation and a better synthesis results and therefore time that therefore timing results. Then we're going to take a look at some of the techniques that we can do, such as control sets and signals. So clock enables and resets, we're going to take a look at. Uh, and then we're going to run through and take a look at some templates, things like pipelining, and we'll have a we'll wrap up with having a chat about checklists as well and, and running through. Uh, running through design reviews at the end. So hopefully it's going to be uh, fairly informative. If you're not too familiar uh, with this, obviously then the uh, ultra fast design methodology, it's a methodology from Xilinx. I will put the link uh, in the documentation as well, which gets shared at the end. But it's a methodology that we can go through that shows us how we will create uh, better FPGA designs that are targeting AMD, techno AMD technology. So that's going to include things such as how we can write code, uh, either VHDL or Verilog, how we can work with synthesis tools um, and placement, the placement tools to give us that better quality of results, to be able to get the uh, performance out of the silicon that the silicon uh, that the silicon is capable of doing. If you notice me looking down to the side, that's because I'm just looking down where the questions are. Uh, questions are occasionally uh, the number one thing that we can that, that is really important to me though when we think about this with FPJ design is getting our architecture correct, and we have to do that from day one. We have to think about how we're going to design our solution from day one. Now I'm I'm a weird engineer, you know, for all the blogs we put out there, all the hacks to projects, all the all the articles we write. The real passion for me in engineering is not necessarily in that writing the HDL code and doing the simulation. The real passion for me is actually in, in working out how we're going to solve that particular, how we're going to solve that particular challenge. How do we, how do we go about addressing that challenge that the customer or somebody's come to us and said, hey, Adam, I'd like to do this. So this is the main thing 
that are that, that that is key for me as we're going through it. So I like to plan from day one how we're gonna how we're gonna do this. So we have a we have a and we're not gonna talk about it too much here, but we you know we have a quite a comprehensive, as I'm sure you will do, quite a comprehensive uh, design review, design methodology to go from uh, design process to go from beginning to the end of the end of the project. The main bit of this that interests me is the is the architectural bit. And if we if we get our design right at the architectural level, then it, it makes whatever comes next, no matter how challenging it is, it makes whatever comes next much simpler and much easier than it would be if we make the wrong architectural choices. So obviously one of the things that we want to do from day one is we want to leverage wherever possible, we want to try and leverage IP cores. And those IP cores we're going to talk about in a minute, you know, those IP cores could be uh, AMD Vivado IP cores. They could be third party IP cores that you found off people's GitHubs. They could be IP cores that we've created and, and put out there. You know, for example, our, our AXI streaming UART and AXI streaming um, SPI seems quite popular with uh, quite popular with people. Or they could be IP cores from a project that you've created and you want to reuse and make sure that uh, make sure that we're redesigning uh, and, and, and reusing those IP cores. It's really it's really good uh, to actually create your own internal library of IP cores such that you can uh, you can keep reusing them and your your design uh, your design process takes less time. Your technical risk is less because you know it already exists. Uh, but it does take time uh, to do them right and get them uh, and get them to be right from from day one. So let's take a little bit of a uh, look on this. And I see somebody's already asked a question already, which I think is really great. Uh, somebody's saying, "How much do I rely on synthesis inference and my RTL versus using primitives?" And that honestly, Jimmy, that that couldn't have been better time because this is kind of what we're going to talk about uh, on this on this slide here as we go through. So typically. When I'm creating the architecture of of our of our FPGAs, one of the things I want to do is to keep my to keep the RTL that I'm generating as generic and portable as as, as possible, uh, and that's because we work with a range of FPGAs. We work with, for example, we work with Spartan Seven, with UltraScale, uh, and with Vessel, and each one of those has got slightly different uh, parameters in there and slightly different. Uh, slightly different primitives in there, for example. So ex a, a great example of this the, the other day that I came across is the um, the difference in the OSERDES and the ODDRs between the 7 Series and the, and the Ultra Scale Series. So whenever possible, what I try to do is I try to keep my functional RTL, my the bits that give my algorithms and, my, and, and so on, my algorithms, my control plane, I try to keep that as pure VHDL Verilog. Um, when I'm working with things that do need that do need primitives, such as IOs, IO CERDES, DDRs, GTHs, MIGs, for example, example or clocking, uh, clocking and resets, what I try to do is I try to keep them contained in their own module at the top level of the design. And what that means then is I have my, within my overall FPGA, as you can see here, I have my core logic, which is the functionality of the design. Uh, and then we have the, the clocks, the resets, the IO synchronization, filtering and such like. What that means is that is if I move from say a Spartan 7 uh, to an ultra scale, I can easily put that, I can easily take that module out re and, and mop in and, and drop in the bit that I want. So George, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So I basically create a wrapper uh, as, an as an instantiation of the primitives. I try not to keep them too too buried down in in levels of, of of logic because it makes it it makes it easier for me to work with the architecture and, and port it from one to the uh, one to the other. Like everything with version control, with uh, with with difficulty. Normally, normally I normally we have we have a specific project. So we if we have a project for that FPJ, the version control that gets checked in for that will be the version will will include all of the the wrappers for that one, be it a, a, a seven series or a um, or an ultra scale. Uh, what we normally do is we normally try and use Tickle to create it, a Tickle script that controls it and creates the generation uh, of the XCI. But sometimes customers don't like that, so we will uh, we will go with the uh, with the XCI. So 
hopefully George that answers hopefully George and Jimmy that answers uh, that answers the questions and it, and they were perfectly timed sort of questions as we uh, as we've dropped into uh, as we dropped into this so one of the things I'm, I'm a big fan of this kind of architecture you know keeping the core logic uh, there and then keeping all the things that might change around around the edge at the uh, at the top level like I say it allows us to move uh, to move between those series is quite quite easily. Uh, one of the things we want to do though is we don't just want to ride a large flat design when it comes to our core when it comes to our core logic. We want to be uh, quite smart about that, and we want to leverage wherever possible. We want to leverage hierarchy uh, in the in the design. So I'm a big fan of of putting sensible sensible high sensible hierarchical approaches in there and this is this reminds me actually i have a question for everybody that is attending in the polls about how you um how you architect your fpgas uh, because typically as you can see i've i, I draw these in a, uh, in a in a in a fairly graphical tool uh, so I'd be, I'd be quite interested as to how people uh, how people do this. But one of the things we want to do is we want to leverage that hierarchy uh, and make sure that we get the get the design uh, design appropriately. And there's some things that we can do uh, when we're thinking about how to do this hierarchy uh, and how to get the best performance out of it. So you're, you're going to hear me say this a few times as we go through here today that we want to really want to leverage this register rich environment that the that the FPGAs have. So one of the key things I'm a really big fan of when it comes to creating my IP, my modules, is I really want to register the inputs of every module that we create and the outputs of every module that we create, wherever possible. And it's like everything here. I'm, I'm giving you general rules that work for the general rules that work for me in most circumstances. In some circumstances, some you know, you, and this is why we're paid as engineers. You don't want you don't want to do this for example you might want to use a combinatorial output if you want a very fast output and not do the register and that's what we're paid for as engineers right we're paid to determine when we should follow the general rules and when we should make exceptions and, and do something different but by default i try to register the inputs and the outputs of, of every module what this means is that it tries to contain the critical path of, of logic to that to that one module that we're working in if we get if we get timing issues it also prevents optimization across module boundaries so if we have two modules for example uh, and we don't and we don't register the outputs of one uh, and the inputs of another then what can happen is we can there can be some optimization during synthesis if we don't control it how we want across both of those modules and then if we get issues where where we're struggling to debug and find where these issues are is it in one module or is it in the other module so if we've got them if we've got the two uh the two registered then it works really uh works really nicely because it's contained uh, and because it's contained that means that we are have a simplified debug and analysis. Now, today we're looking at how to write better code uh, in this one. We're looking at better code, better architectures, things. In about three weeks' time, at the end of this month, we have another webinar, because this is one of a series of four. Uh, we have another webinar where we're going to look at timing. Uh, it's called Tackling Timing. And we're going to work through how, if you've got timing issues, we can work through a design and try to find and try to find the try to find the timing issues and create a baseline create a baseline timing closure. Uh, and techniques like this are really are really important to help us to uh, to achieve that. So one of the things that we can do uh, with uh, with this functionality is make sure that we once we've got our architecture defined and we've got our uh, we've got our and we've registered our inputs and outputs, we can use synthesis attributes to make sure that we're using that we're that we're keeping this architecture so we can use for example the keep high the keep hierarchy element in there and we can also use the the, the shift register extraction if we need to uh to to extract that so i see a couple of questions so let's let's try and take a uh take a take a look through that so faisal said when dealing with ram do you put in the control logic or do you also treat that as a control uh, as an external module so Faisal, what I normally try and do with block RAM is if it's in the core of the FP, if it's in the core of the FPGA, uh, I try to just uh, infer it and let the synthesis tool infer it. Uh, and then that will obviously give me the, the control logic and everything I, and everything I need. Uh, if I'm being more specific on the example, 
then I would write something at the top level uh, and put the control logic into to support that as uh, to support that as well. But by but by and large, I try to get block params to be uh, to be to be inferred, not not instantiated. Uh, so there's a question about uh, what the port list itself of the inputs and outputs would be. Uh, so that's a question that somebody uses Verilog uh, has put in there, whether it's the register or the, or the logic type. Uh, I tend to write VHDL, so my, my, logic inputs, my, my logic inputs and outputs are just similar input or output. Uh, I don't write too much Verilog, I'm, I, I'm afraid, so I'm going to I'll look that up for you. Um, Venkat and let you, uh, let you let you know. So Dan, so yeah, so the keep hierarchy might result in you missing out some optimizations uh, that you actually that you actually want. Uh, and it's like everything in in life. I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying you have to apply this, uh, but it's it's a useful tool in it's a useful tool in the toolbox uh, to to help us. And one of the things you're going to see as we uh, as we move on is we can. Uh, do additional. We can make additional block level optimizations and block level block level synthesis attributes uh, to help us uh, with this um, optimization. That's a good. That's a good point, Paul. You know, it's it's useful at the beginning when you're trying to do that early debug and you're trying to find the early signals, or when you're trying to when you're trying to get the baseline timing closure. Because one of the first things I'm always trying to do with uh, with FPJs is initially just try to get timing closure to be uh, to be achieved so sometimes that ability to have the registers have the registers in there uh, and prevent optimization can, can it can help you uh, clear it can help you clear thing, clear things up and keep things going um, and then obviously as you move on you might want to start removing uh, removing removing constraints um, and such like one of the no, one of the interesting things you'll see if you read the user fast uh, design design methodology guide is it re, is it recommends having a layered approach like a little bit of, like a little bit of a uh, little bit of an onion so it recommends having your module uh, which we which you instantiate with the uh, with the inputs and the outputs registered it also recommends actually uh, putting a placement wrapper around around that module uh, and in that module in that placement wrapper all you do uh, is you put uh, you put additional registers in there essentially uh, what that means is that when when this comes to doing its actual when it comes to actually doing the placement in the in the logic of the fpga uh, because we have those extra registers in the um in the placement wrapper I'm going to say placement a lot, uh, but it, while we have those extra registers in the placement wrapper, what it means is we can play it, the, the placer can put the can put the logic, uh, but it can also put those registers. It's also got those registers which help with higher performance because it it means that the signals are registered as they're going through there, so they don't need to cross the die so much or cross so far in a uh, in what in one clock cycle. So again, it's the, it's one of those engineering things where you're trading um latency for latency for performance uh, but it can really help you achieve that time uh, achieve a faster uh more high performing design uh by doing that so oh that's a really good question oh uh, so Armando has just asked a question um uh with the uh, about ip george i'll come to your question in a second uh if you if you're using ip if it'll affect the link checks and if it's worth to check all those link checks for ip modules by and large we have no control over ip modules we have no control over what's in the what's in the ip uh, and we do a lot of linting for our sort of our do254 and, and our space applications uh by and large I try not to, we, we, we tend to exclude IP modules, unless it's an IP module that we've written. Uh, we tend to exclude the, um, we tend to exclude the, um, the IP course from, uh, from our linting checks, because otherwise what you end up with is you end up with thousands of errors and warnings on, on, a, on a core, uh, and you've got no control over that. You can't make any changes to it. You can't edit it or anything like that. So it's it's not too uh, not too worthwhile doing it. Sam, if you're not familiar, LinkedIn is basically looking at the RTL uh, and applying structural checks to make sure it complies with coding standards 
and with um, with other maybe structural checks that you do. It depends. Linting can be quite like it's just checking that it's completeness and you've not done anything really stupid all the way through to some really detailed uh, detailed checks on, on the structure of your code using static analysis and tools like Sagasi or Blue Pearl's Visual Verification Suite uh, can help you uh, can help you do that. Uh, George, your answer is your answer. Yeah, if you read the user guide, the um, ultra fast design methodology uh, user guide, that's one of the recommendations is really to leverage that register rich environment of, of FPGAs uh, and, and wrap as many wrap as much as you can in 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 registers uh, and, and use and leverage those registers. I don't know if that aligns with your experience, uh, but that's that's some of the things that we uh, we try to do. Uh, Rami can, can be a placement script to guide the placement registers uh, to be close to each other. So Rami, you, there's a lot of things that we can do um, in the um, in the FPGA for, for placement if you want to. So you can do placement scripts to guide placement. Uh, you can create what are called P blocks, which what which are areas in the uh, in the logic where you say I want this block to be instantiated here, uh, or you can create rel uh, relatively placed macros as well where you say, I don't, you don't really care where in the device they're placed, but you want them all placed relationally uh, with each other so that they're, that they're close. Uh, George, that's a great point. Uh, the more registers you have, obviously the impact comes in onto, comes into effect latency. Uh, so it, it's one of the key things that we have to, have to trade off as an engineer, right? Is what, what should we, act, what do the rules recommend and what is the, what is the kind of some approaches that are recommended against some of the some of the some of the needs of our of our applications and, and our and our choices so there might be times when latency is key and we want to keep the and we want to keep the number of registers down uh down to a uh down to, down to a minimum uh in which case we wouldn't do that but we wouldn't wrap everything in registers but we might accept then that we have to do more uh, in the placement in the in the routine and, and and more work with the work with the constraints to achieve timing uh, time enclosure. Yes, George, that's a great, that's a great, uh, that's a great, uh, that's a great approach to uh, to do it. Actually, so I will, uh, Mindangus, I will talk about CI/CD in a future blog. Um, I have a huge list of blogs that I have <laughs> planned. Uh, CI/CD has been in one for an awful long time that I should get round, uh, that I should get round to doing. Uh, I've just not had, uh, not had chance to. To doing it yet so we've talked about sort of what we can do with the uh with the with the with the at the high level you know leverage the uh leverage the modules leverage leverage the register rich environment of it think about some of the constraints that we can use to to keep this in here uh, one of the key things that i'm a big um yes carl that's a great point actually about uh, latency versus whether it's time or clock cycles um one of the great things actually about creating reuse blocks and be able to reuse them is when we create our architecture is making sure that we interface things correctly with each other. Now, I'm a real big fan of having an, uh, of having an IP library. We've got quite a large, at Aduva, we've got quite a large uh, IP library. Uh, it amazes me actually how, how large it is, our internal IP library. Uh, but everything within it, within, within reason, uh, tends to use the AXI standard. So we use the AXI memory map, for example, for high bandwidth memory map stuff. We use AXI light for setting registers and AXI stream for transferring, uh, for transferring data across. It's a really useful standard to use. And particularly if you're developing custom IP, I would recommend you sort of went with this approach and selected uh, something such as um, AXI to work with and to use. Uh, that interface. If you're not too familiar with it, I guess most people uh, most people on here are. But if you're not too familiar with it, you know there's a master interface, a slave interface. Although I think the naming's been updated at the moment, uh, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Uh, and you have essentially two channels: you have a read channel and a write channel, uh, and that allows us with the full AXI memory map that allows us to do burst transactions uh, on the read, to do read burst transactions, write burst transactions. We can have security on it. We can do, there are extensions to cache coherence. So it's a really nice and flexible, scalable uh, scalable interface. If you want to take a little bit more at how to work with it, then actually there's a couple of my hacks to projects more recently uh, that we've published that show this. One of these shows how to 
go from QSPI into AXI. Uh, so as you can play with it in, in that direction as well. But it's actually, it looks daunting to write IP that's going to do this uh, and is going to drive this. But actually, you can write a couple of packages or a couple of libraries. Um, and it's relatively simple uh, to do to implement the high speed interface and even the, the low speed interface. It's a it's a very good methodology to, to standardize on uh, on this. One of the key things I will I will recommend though is uh, because I've been caught out by this a few times is the handshaking. If you look at the address, if you look at the uh, address channel on the right channel, there are some handshaking protocols that go across in there. Make sure that you never get the deadlock uh, because it's if if you have to wait for the whenever your signal is whenever your data as the producer is ready, you should assert the valid signal, and then when the consumer is 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 uh, in a position to accept data, it will assert its ready signal and the data transfer will occur. What you must never do is wait on the wait on the consumer becoming ready before you actually say, "I've got some new data for you." Because in that situation, uh, it can lead to it can lead to deadlocks. But it's re it's a really useful gray uh, IP uh, that we should be uh, we should be looking at and working through. And now I'm worried that we're not going to get through this in an hour because I'm talking far too I'm talking far too uh, far too much uh, about all this stuff. The stream is another great interface. You know, it, it's just a unidirectional, never-ending stream of data, and that's great for connecting IP blocks IP blocks together if they're just on the on the data path in the FPJ. So if you're doing signal processing, image processing, it's a really nice, really simple standard uh, to use and to just stream that data through from one point uh, one point to the other. Um, like I say, it's key for it's key for development. You can create a couple of simple little libraries for it, which will help you, which will help you do this. I'll make these libraries that I've got showing on the screen available uh, on on my GitHub in the next day or so. Uh, but there's a couple of libraries in there that will allow you to read and write over AXI with just a simple function call if you're using uh, VHDL to do AXI four, AXI Lite, or AXI streamed uh, stream tran stream transactions. It's a very important thing in my view. Uh, to do that. One of the things we want to do as well, and I, and I should have perhaps put this a little bit up the top, is within Vivado, we can we want to be able to decompose our hierarchy into as many functional blocks as possible. Uh, so in this case here, I've created several uh, several blocks on the uh, to show the, to show the example. One block uh, that contains the uh, the processing element. One block that contains the uh, memory element. There's some inputs and outputs for the uh, HD, HDMI, and then there is an image processing, uh, an image processing chain as well, which is contained within them. Now, the nice thing about this is, if you do it within Vivado, actually, is while we want to reshare IP blocks and, and they're quite useful, uh, we can also use the write BD tickle function uh, to be able to write out one of these modules in, it, in its entirety. Uh, with all its sub connections and with all its connections beneath it. Now this becomes really useful. I have a I have a collection of tickle scripts uh, that will create structures for me uh, in Vivado and create these little hierarchical blocks from, for example, a HDMI input to a HDMI output to a full image to a, to a full image processing path. You can just put those scripts under change control and then you can rerun them. Uh, and then just push them through. But it's a really nice, efficient way of working, um, working with the uh, working with working with hierarchy and, and getting some reuse out of it, such that you uh, don't don't need to do that. Uh, George, this is actually in the uh, IP uh, this IP integrator uh, flow that this this diagram has come from. It's come from IP integrator, uh, so you can you can use that in there. Um, I'll come, Francesco. I'll come back to your question at the end if we if we get a few minutes at the end. Um, so, Adil, yeah, your HDMI inputs and outputs. I have some projects on my Hackster. If you drop me an email afterwards, I'll point you to them. They'll show you how to work with the HDMI in and out on the Zybo because just behind me, that you can't see it, uh, but you can't see it in my office. I've got a Zybo running a uh, Sobel filter example that just runs for. Uh, 24 24/7 so if you want to do that it, it can we can do this really easily just by sort of dragging and dropping and, and pulling these modules together uh, into that hierarchical block you can literally just group them together 
and, and put them uh, and put them into those to, into those blocks um, and keep trying to use um, keep trying to use that. Armando, keep that thought in mind because we're going to talk about pipelining in a minute, and I have an example of uh, pipelining uh, coming up. Uh, so yeah, it's a really, really, you know, that architectural stage is really, uh, is really good. So somebody saying, do you prefer to do chip level architecture? Oh, with RTL directly, do you have concerns about maintainability of tickle? Da, 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 da. Uh, so that's a great question. So I tend to, um, I tend to keep my IP integrator is very good it, and you need it for certain things, for example, for uh processor systems things like nox on versal and such like although that's going to be changing like you sips on versal and such like you need it some gths you, you you need to use ip integrator uh what i tend to do for for for, for a lot of our production designs is we have a small limited uh ip integrator element uh and then we break out we have like a hybrid flow where we break out the axi connections or other connections and the rest of it is in uh, is actually in RTL. Um, that's just because we've got a large RTL library, and, and, and we like to we like to reuse it. Uh, I don't really have any concerns about maintainability of the of the BD tickle. I think I think that's actually pretty pretty solidish at the moment. Uh, but it, I, I get where you're I get where you're coming from with that uh, with that with that question. Uh, so normally we we sort of in fact actually I'll write a blog on it because. It, there's more it'll probably take me more it'll probably take me the next 30 minutes to explain how we do it uh but it, but if you're familiar with our blogs and read our blogs i'll write a blog on how we do it such that you can uh you can you can see this sort of hybrid uh hybrid approach so just one just one last thing because while we're talking about architectures is i'm very keen and all of my engineers that, that work for me i'm very keen on documenting uh, if you if you write your own IP blocks, please document it. <laughs> um, please make sure that you've documented it enough such that you can use it. So you know, do the simple standard things. You know, define the requirements, define the interfaces. You know, create the micro architecture like you can see here, uh, and then create the test bench. So this is our uh, this would be our quad our quad SPI to AXI stream interface. Uh, so we have a lot of interfaces that go from uh, something uh, like SPI, I squared C, QSPI, two AXI stream, and then we can we can plumb it using some IP calls that we have into the rest of our uh, into the rest of our network. But really, please think about that. Please think about those architectures, that documentation, uh, because that's what's going to help you. You can remember it in your head now. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Micro architecture can be a can be a pen drawing. Actually, this drawing came from uh, while it looks like a pen drawing. This drawing came from Enterprise Architect. Uh, but, but that's that's just how I how I happen to how I happen to draw it. So one of the things we want to I want to change track a little bit and talk a little bit more now in in depth about some of the challenges that we uh, that we have when we come to actually writing the code and thinking about how we implement that code. Now one of the things that we see in our FPGAs and that can cause us problems is with things such as control sets. So a control set is basically uh, things like resets or clock or clock enables and we have to be very careful about how we uh, how we how we work with them uh, and what's very nice with working with sram based fpgas uh, like amd devices is that whenever possible you know when this device turns on it goes through an initialization and as part of that initialization the global set reset is asserted and that actually means that all of our logic in our design is going to come up into a into a known state. It's going to come up to a zero generally, or for a few examples, it might come to a come to a one. But most registers, um, it comes to a zero or one. My thing is, yeah, I'm a big fan of Teros. I am a big big fan of Teros HDL. Uh, all of our all of our designs we use uh, we use we use Teros HDL and the wave drum and, and everything like that in it. Uh, so we have the we have the global set reset, and that allows us to to essentially to make sure that our our register comes up in a, our registers come up in a defined state. It's why in the our FPGAs when we can put initial states on on our registers relatively easy without having to use the use the set reset. Now, if we want to get the best performance from our FPGA, 
uh, and our logic, one of the key things we should do is minimize. Well, there's two things we should do. One is we should minimize the use of resets wherever possible um, in our in our FPGA. Uh, and if you've been on my mission critical course, it's it's odd I understand to hear me saying that. But for for for, for performance in our FPGAs, we want to minimize that level of we want to minimize the number of resets we have. The reason why we do that is because if we put a reset on all of our registers, that can limit the synthesis tool from being able to make optimizations. Uh, and those optimizations include rolling registers or shift registers into SRLs. If they have a reset, we can't they can't be packed into SRLs. Uh, if they don't have a reset, they can. The other thing is if we decide that we need a reset, so if we decide that we need a reset, then we have to be very careful about what reset we want to we want to take into account. So if we take a look at the DSP48, for example, it's got registers in there. It's got the dual AD, the dual B register. It's got the output. It's got the output registers and, uh, and middle registers as well. Now, if we want to leverage this and to get the best to get the best performance from this, if you read the ultrafast design methodology guide, what it will say is before the DSP48 element, put two two stages of uh, register in up front and and register the output, which which we need to do. Uh, if we do that, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we use the right reset. So these registers have a synchronous reset on them. So one of the things that we need to make sure is that if we don't use the right reset structure for the tar for, for the logic that we're targeting, it will have a big impact on our design. It will have a huge impact on the performance and the uh, uh, actually the power as well and the logic utilization of the design. So if we're trying to pack registers into the A register, the D register, the C register, the middle register, the output register of the uh, of the DSP, it can have a big uh, a big impact. So let's just take a look at this for a second. So I wrote a simple thing, and I have the project. I'll show you the project in a uh, in a second. I have the project open. I wrote a simple thing. I wanted to multiply a couple of numbers using a DSP forty eight. Um, in the first instance here, I wrote a asynchronous reset. Now, one of the great things about the one of the things about using an asynchronous reset, obviously, is it occurs, uh, but it, it's not what we want to use on the DSP48. So what we come to, if we take a look at the utilization when we run this through and we map it all, uh, we can ignore the I.O. for a minute because this was just this one module put in there. Uh, but what we see is it uses um, 16 lookup tables, 65 flip flops and one DS and one DSP. So this is using registers it's using lookup tables it's using registers and the dsp to give us the to give us the multiplication uh, that we uh, that we want so take a look at that remember that flip flop and that uh, hey here Ash, don't worry about it it's all recorded anyway uh, so we've got the flip flop and the look utilization so 65 flip flop 16 looks one dsp and we can see that in our implement in our implementation um, and we can see that we have, in this instance, we have the DSP48, uh, and we have all of the input register, the, the two stages of registers running running before this. Um, the next thing we have is if we run the DSP element, the register element here, we will see and run it with a synchronous reset. Oh, I'll change the slides momentarily because they've got the, uh, afterwards, I've still got the, um, I've got the wrong code showing. I've got the synchronous reset code showing. Silly Adam. Um, but if we run this through, we see that we have a DSP, only one DSP being used. And the difference for this, if we look at the code, is our DSP is able to be packed in to um, our DSP is be able, is unlike the previous example where we had lots of registers on the output of our DSP around surrounding our DSP 48. In this case, they're all packed in and included within our DSP 48. So that means we have better utilization, we have better performance, and we have better thermal performance because we're not taking as much power. Uh, so we get an overall solution uh, in there. 
Sam, the, there's, a, there's a global set reset, which happens at the end of initialization, which will give you the ability to, to, to control what your outputs go to, uh, go to safely. So the other element that we can the other element we can do with this is we can control the regi that we want to look at the clock enables and control the clock enables. Now, if we've got a large um, yes, Jimmy, that's exactly right. We're targeting the internal DSP registers instead of using external registers, which gives us a lot better, a lot higher performance than it would if we used the external registers, or just by changing changing a reset. Excuse me. So. The other element that we want to consider is control sets and control sets like clock enables and the reset as well can give us a lot of issues with congestion uh, and, and routing areas. So if you're worried about which type of reset to use, the best way to do that is to read the user guides for the actual logic that you're targeting. So if you want to target a DSP48, read the DSP48 user, user guide to work out what sort of reset it, it requires. Uh, generally, by default, I try to use synchronous resets if I have to use them uh, within within AMD uh, within AMD Fabric because that gives us more that gives us more flexibility. It means that we're going to map them uh, map them in there. So clock enables obviously useful in our device if we want to run things if we want to run things through uh, and make them uh, and. And, and enable them as and when we do it, and similar with set and set and reset. But what this can do is it can give us a lot of um, a significant sort of cone of logic going into a specific a specific quick flow. So if you've ever looked too much into the synthesis options, you'll see there is this control set optimization threshold, uh, and this tells the synthesis engine essentially whether to use the reset using the actual dedicated path going into the flip-flop, such as the control enable or the clock enable or the reset, or whether to create some logic to then drive to, to then drive that uh, that reset or that or that clock enable. And there's a couple of examples here that we have where we can use the by default, it might decide to use the data path uh, implementation. So you can see here the D type flip-flop, it's got a clock enable, the data's coming in. And it's using a lot basically external to, to, to do that clock to do that clock enabling. Uh, if we actually give it a if we tell it to, uh, we can extract that and we can tell it to actually use a direct implementation. Uh, then we see here the direct implementation is run through into the flip flop uh, flip flop enabling there. And this just gives us options when we're when we're looking at our design and we're looking at elements such as congestion and such like. This gives us options and flexibility to get through and make sure that we're doing a sense of, that we've got all of the options, all of the tools that we need in our toolbox uh, to work through this. The other thing we might want to do, we can do this not only on, uh, not only can we do this on uh, clock enables, we can also do this on resets, as you can see here, where we've got the, re where the initial reset is uh, running through some common, running through some logic. Uh, this this look for down here, uh, but if we actually tell it to do a direct instantiate a direct path on the global reset, uh, then we see that the logic gets the logic gets remapped, the data gets remapped, and the and the global reset runs uh, runs di runs directly. So that gives us a much nicer and again flexible and controllable method of of, of working with this uh, working with this FPG, FPGA. So let's take a move on now before we run out of time. So if you want to do this, you can control this via via the synthesis settings. We can set by default the uh, control set optimization threshold is is set at auto. But if we want to, we can we can change this, or we can add attributes as you just saw directly into the RTL uh, to to make sure that we can uh, run this through uh, and get the performance that we uh, that we want. Now, in our final, uh, final little bit of time, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, pipelining. Uh, so pipelining is, is really important in our designs. It allows us to restructure, it allows us to restructure data paths, uh, which have got several layers of logic. So it might be that we've got a very long path with a lot of combinatorial logic in it. Obviously, moving for the delays through that combinatorial logic, the delays through that route in the combinatorial logic might mean that we can't achieve the timing closure, the timing performance that we want. 
Therefore, pipelining allows us to insert register stages in that combinatorial logic and gives us a higher gives us a higher performance. Obviously, again, it comes out of trade off with latency, but it gives us that higher overall uh, higher overall uh, clocking performance. Now, as we've seen. When we talked about the architecture at the beginning, we said put the registers in on the inputs and the outputs, consider a placement wrapper, put the registers in uh, in there as well. But when it actually comes to writing our code, one of the things that we want to do to get the best Fmax that we can do, the best performance that we can do, is if we have um, Chad, we're going to be talking about that in a little while. And we've got in our tackling timing webinar, we're going to talk very deeply about how to handle routing, how to handle routing congestion. Uh, Martin, I'll come back to your question in a in a little second. So if we've got two flip flops like this and we've got a large number of logic layers in between those two flip flops, then we want to consider uh, doing some uh, retiming and putting some uh, functionality in there to give us that ability to, to, to insert pipelining. So what we can do, one of the ways that we need to do it is when we're writing our code is we need to consider pipelining from day one. Uh, and what that means is when we write the code, and actually I'll put all these design examples, the Vivado design examples up on a GitHub and link that with the um, with the slides as well, is adding extra registers either before or after your combinatorial, your combinatorial path. Uh, so in this example here, I've added in a couple, quite a few registers actually, uh, just, to, just to show, just to get the point across. But we can add in extra registers at the end of it. Uh, what happens then is, by default, as Vivado goes through its um, its synthesis results, if it sees additional registers and the global retiming option is available, what it will do is it will move those registers if they're attached to the back of the code. It will move those registers back through the through the through the logic to balance to to balance the delays through the logic automatically. If obviously if they're for, if they're in front of the logic, it will move them forward. If they're behind the logic, it will it will move them backwards, uh, and that that applies by using the global timing synthesis. Now we can also do that using the block timing functionality, the block synthesis attributes as well. If we just want to do it on a specific block, we can just apply that to a specific a specific block also. If that's um, if that's not um, if that's not optimal for you and it's not and Vivado is not performing exactly what you want it to do, then there are some attributes that you can put in your source code, such as retiming forwards or retiming backwards to move those registers. So, Kamal, what happens, and I'll show you a second in Vivado, what happens is during, synth during synthesis, yeah, do, well, during synthesis, those registers, we put those registers on the back end. But during synthesis, what will happen is Vivado will move those registers back into that combinatorial path to where it best thinks they need to be to give you the performance and to, to give you the performance at the clock rate that you're that you're suggesting. So you don't have to do that as long as the delay, as long as the registers are in there, Vivado will run through and it will automatically move them backwards into the place that it wants that it thinks the best. In that in that logic, and because you've already included them in your design and done that synthesis in your design, it doesn't make any change to your latency or your performance. It's just Rivado just moving those registers and rebalancing the delay, uh, the delay line as to where it thinks it should be. So I have a quick example of a pipelined um, pipeline design. Here we can see we have some registers on the input. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to actually create an example that uh, that actually breaks and gives you exactly what you want. Uh, but we have some we're doing some multiplication uh, of some values, and then we have some registers on the back end on the back end here. The number of uh, the number of stages. Uh, and we can see when we run this through when we run when we run this through the design, and I'll and I'll put this design on a GitHub and, and share it with uh, with you as well. Uh, we can see in the synthesis report that it actually reports that it moves the registers back into the into the design, uh, and you can see that then uh, within uh, within the design. If you open up the synthesize, if you open up the synthesized design, you can see it's a lot. It's a huge mess of logic because obviously it's a synthesized design, but you can see where the logic's been inserted and put in there. 
Yes, George, that's exactly the point that you're, that's exactly what I was talking about. So because you've, because we've got the, uh, the registers already in there, uh, it just rebalances, it just rebalances them. You don't have to use six by default. This was just my example. This was just my example. Uh, again, it's a bit of like a, an engineering uh, best practice type thing to work out how many you think you might need. But it's also good practice to put in a, a flops. And then that gives you the extra, uh, the extra flexibility that you might that you might want. Okay, we've just done that. Um, one of the things that we might want to do in our design is when we first run it through. Yes, yeah, yeah. Keyword being initially there, Judge. One of the things that we might want to do is we might want to find out where the where we might want to consider pipelining, uh, which hopefully Harris is about to answer your question. So what we can do is we can run the design analysis report after we've after we've initially run it through, uh, and we can click on this option here, the include logic level distribution tick here, uh, and when we run that through that will give us a example of the logic levels uh, that are in the uh, in the design uh, i was trying to remember which design i did this on earlier on i've got a feeling i did this on a design that included a microblaze 5 uh, which might be why you see some high uh, logic uh, logic levels uh, but you can see what it will do is it for each clock path it will break you down uh, a level a number of uh, the number of logic levels that's included on that particular clock path. So, for example, on our on our pixel clock in, most of these are within the sort of the the, the one to two sort of um, logic levels, whereas we've got some that are up there at the slight slightly uh, slightly higher. So we can do this as a as a guide to tell us where we might want to consider in our in our design. Uh, and what we want to do. So Harris, what we're going to talk about. So this pipeline is, is, is quite interesting and allows you to break it down. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we're going to run another webinar in a couple of weeks time called Tackling Timing. And we're going to work through in that timing instance, we're going to say, well, if you've done all this stuff that we've talked about in this webinar, but you've still got timing issues, here's how you can work through uh, and uh, work through work through the design and get to the root cause of your timing issues. And get that initial timing analysis and timing uh, timing base out there. If you can do that, we can see that within the once we've done that. If you open the design, uh, we can see that in the floor plan of the design as well. We can then take a look at the floor plan of the design. Uh, we can take a look at levels that have got zero logic levels in there as well, and, and see what's going in there. But it just gives us more visibility in the design and helps us to work out what we what we might want to be uh, we might want to be considering for our design. Now, finally, when it comes to doing the uh, the performance side, the side of things, we can select some options such as we can move them backwards, we can move them forwards. We can try, we can ask it to do some, to, to balance the control signals as well for, for, for latency. Uh, it will, for the, for the question about those registers, whether they're on the inputs or outputs, it will move that if they're in the same module, it will retime them forwards or backwards, depending upon whether they're in the, up the front or, or on the or, or on the back end. One of the things that we can do, you know, is we want to make sure that we're using the right sort of shift register style as well, if we put shift registers in there. So in the example, you'll see I uploaded, uh, we controlled the shift register extraction as well to make sure that we didn't get these registers uh, combined into shift register uh, SRLs because we need these for the pipeline balancing in in actual registers. So this is something to uh, to carefully uh, consider. One of the things that we're doing what, that we can do as well is the tool is capable also of doing auto pipelining, uh, and that's also able to inject pipelining pipelining that we want. Uh, to help us meet to help us meet requirements, it can do this in very specific circumstances. Okay, uh, so it's not going to do it in it's not going to do it in everything for you, and it's mainly based around doing SRL crossing. So from logic regions in the stack silicon devices, it's mainly based around that. Uh, but the two areas that we can do this in are the AXI the, the AXI register slice, and uh, we can do this via uh, HDL attributes and constraints. In which case, we give it a set of parameters to meet, and the tool will go away and try uh, try to meet that. So to do this, we can define these auto pipe. We have to define auto pipelining groups, 
so these are areas where we can where it will insert where it can auto insert pipelining. Uh, we have to obviously we have to enable it and tell it what signals to include in that. And then we have to limit the number of pipelining stages that it can insert from between zero to 20 uh, to 24. Uh, and we have to tell it what modules that we want within the design. But within reason, it, it, it can go away and do this. But like I say, it's generally meant to do this in functionality such as um, crossing SLRs and such like. It's not something that you want to put into your design uh, every day, every in, into every day, ev into every day, uh, into every day usage in there. Uh, so, Paul, I don't, but I tell you what I will do. I will put it on my list of blogs and I will get a uh, I will get a blog example up and working uh, with it. Or, or if it or if it turns out to be rather large and deep, I'll get an example running on Hackster or something uh, and we'll put we'll put it up there um, and we'll and we'll get it working for you. So with a couple of minutes for any questions for anybody that might have any, you know. Think about FPGAs, you know, think about that architecture, think about leveraging that register rich environment of the FPGA. Uh, make sure we can leverage IP reuse wherever possible um, and leverage those standard interfaces to allow us to allow us to do that. Uh, make sure that we can work with our um, control sets to minimize and uh, minimize and extract those control sets as, as we needed. Um, and of course, you know, take that pipeline in is, is really key to, to do that. Let's just take a quick look through uh, through the questions now, because I just saw a few coming up. So I'll try and answer them if you hang around, even if we run on a little bit after the hour. So come on. Yeah, this webinar will be recorded. It'll be available back on this link. If you come back to this link, it'll typically be available a little while. It will also be available on my YouTube channel and via our website, uh, aduvoengineering.com. Uh, so you should be able to find it, uh, find it there. Uh, okay, glad you found it invitable. So I'll. So if you want to do a, so here's a good uh, thing. Let me just share this link. There's some up and coming webinars. So let me just remember how to uh, how to do this. I'll get a link for you to share for you to come up. Uh, if I go to here, view all events, copy that. So if you want to sign up for future webinars that we've got, you can see them uh, on the link I've just put in there. Um, and we'll see how we can go from there. Uh, so Francisco, uh, when working with really large register, register maps, how do you optimize it for hardware consumption? Uh, generally with, with great, not gonna lie, like a lot of things with great difficulty, uh, I try to break them down into what we can put into, into block RAMs or ultra RAMs or, or something like that. Uh, but large register maps are always, are always quite difficult. We did one recently, it got 10,000 Ten thousand registers in it, uh, and it was it was quite a uh, quite a difficult sort of challenge. Uh, but yeah, that's 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 it really. There's no sort of um, no sort of magic answer, I'm afraid. I'll also put a just a quick link in there to our website, and that's um, that's where you'll find where you'll find that Mandingus, Possibly, I'm not going to mention. Uh, that on there but yeah maybe we'll do something uh, maybe we'll do something on that as well uh so thank you very much for coming um uh and and we'll uh um, please come along to the next ones that it really means a lot to me if you come along and, and support these things it's really good i like talking about epigis if you've got any recommendations for any future webinars any topics you want to see on the amd universe drop me an email mention it in the comments Reach out to me on LinkedIn, Reddit, Twitter, one of the social media places where uh, where we are, uh, and we'll we'll try and do it. But apart from that, thank you, uh, thank you so much. I hope these skills, I hope these things we've talked about are useful. Uh, and yeah, hopefully I'll see you at our tackling timing webinar, which is going to be a little bit more hands on than that. There's there'll not be uh, there'll not be as much PowerPoint in that one. We're going to actually walk through uh, an example real world uh, real world design in there and try and uh, try and get timing closure on it so thank you very much i'm going to end the uh, end the webinar now 
but yeah, have a great day, great evening where you all are. And once again, thank you very much for um, coming and, uh, and sharing your, your time with me.